So I'm to Good afternoon. It is a privilege for me to introduce the next speaker, Lieutenant General in Reserves, Moshe Bugiyalon, who since he joined the army in 68 has dedicated his life to the security of Israel. And had I need to go over all the milestones in his biography, then I wouldn't have left him time to speak. So therefore, I will keep it brief. But in the framework of his service in the army, he filled many senior roles. He was, of course, in the Special Chief of Staff Command. He was a commander of it, and he was the commander of the Northern Command and other commands, and then the Deputy General, um, Chief of General Staff, and all afterwards the Chief of General Staff, and after that in, the, in politics, also in the Knesset, various ministerial positions. And he is now the former Minister of Defense. Shalom. And for all those who need interpreting, please take earphones. So thank you very much, Dr. Shaul Shai, for the introduction and for the invitation, Major General, in reserves, Amos Gilad, for having invited me. I would like to share with you my various uh, sort of diagnosis about various things, uh, security issues, internal Israeli issues, in such a way that I see the various sort of order of importance at the moment. After all, a whole year has elapsed since the last Herzliya conference, and so many changes have taken place, and I'd like to talk about them. Fifty years ago, this month, Six-Day War. So in a historical perspective, on the 5th of June, 1967, 0745, the Arab coalition collapsed. The various ideologies that had led at that point, Baathism, Nazarism, Pan um, Arabism, all of those collapsed and suddenly the war then opened up and it was a very, very tough defeat for the Arab countries. Well, now there is no Arab coalition. So many things happened along the way that brought about a situation where our neighbors started sort of uh, actually making peace with us. We're talking about, first of all, the first uh, strategic alliance or already in 1970. I was a young, at the time I was in Beta Shita, I was a young paratrooper and ready to be sent to North Jordan so that, that, so that a Syrian armed regiment wouldn't actually invade. But of course, Black September, and there's a connection between all of them. That's how that accord with Jordan was signed. But at the end of seven, the 70s, Sadat also came to that conclusion. There's no way of defeating Israel with conventional war, because there would be a way to get Sinai back. You need a peace agreement which we were privileged and uh, very fortunate to see in 79. So now let's just skip to the last seven years. In the last seven years, one can say that they are perhaps characterized in the Middle East by a political, geopolitical earthquake. Uh, Professor Hagai Ehrlich published a book recently. He's a Middle East uh, expert, and he said that this is the greatest crisis since the days of Muhammad. And I'm not sure that all of us have truly understood and fathomed that, because really it is since the seventh century it is the greatest revolution of all. So I think that for all of us, and for the Sunni Arab countries as well, and our allies around the world at the helm, the United States, they understand that in order to stabilize the Middle East, it's not really going to happen in the near future. Maybe it's a, a Western kind of impact with a kind of that uh, the non-artificial uh, countries and patronistic, perhaps, ideas. I mean, it's a kind of patronistic influence, we can call, 
perhaps with a certain amount of ignorance or only just wishful thinking or naivete. I won't go into that true deep analysis of it, but anyone who does try and analyze it and who truly wants to grapple will just have to grapple with those challenges of the future and understand how everything works. Now, what really characterizes the Middle East in the previous um, American administration, they decided not to play the role of a sort of a world policeman. Instead, they decided to fight against ISIS. They reached an agreement with Iran, and the vacuum was created because of that policy was filled by three Islam radical streams that are not connected to Israel, not because it, it's not because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but each of them aspires to hegemony in each in their own individual way. These streams, one of them is ISIS or Al-Qaeda, those who aspire for uh, an Arab caliphate, and they aspire for a hegemony that will be an Islam one according to their path and faith. The second one is Iran, who aspires, and everything you heard in the previous discussion, who aspires for a regional hegemony. Yes, the actual survivability of the regime is critical, this, and because of the threat against its survivability, they reached the negotiating table with the Americans and then the five plus one, and it wasn't just in order to safeguard the regime, but in order to export the revolution. Look how much they are investing in this Shiite impact, and successfully so, because of this American weakness at the time with a dominance in Baghdad and hegemony in Damascus. As a result of the actual support of the Alawite and the Assad regime, since the 80s in Lebanon with the Hezbollah as an Iranian central arm, of course, against us as well. And now in Yemen as well with the Houthis. So, of course, the, the Iranians can rub their hands with pleasure and continue trying to undermine the various regimes in the area. After Iran is, is in, involved in the Shiite population in Saudi Arabia, and they have many other plans as well. And they, by the way, have not conceded their plans with the, the nuclear, their nuclear plans, because they know that you need to export a revolution in the region and then beyond it. After all, we're talking about the dissemination of their ideology and the hegemony throughout the Middle East. The other thing that filled the actual vacuum was the Muslim Brotherhood. And for those who are at the helm there, is also a member of NATO, Abu Erdogan, the Turkish, from Turkey. And since 2002, taking over Turkey from within, the weakening of the democratic sort of uh, gatekeepers with an intention of a neo-Ottoman uh, sort of empire with the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, a weakness that enabled him to play these games with a possibility enabling the jihadists to join ISIS in Syria and in Iraq and then to go back to their countries like in Europe as uh, terrorists. And of course, the result is what we are witnessing now in Europe. And the other third thing is Islamization, which we've seen in Europe. And it was encouraged by him. It wasn't just refugees. And we see them in Europe. And these really challenging all the governments in Europe. They're asking you know, the, the Muslim women to start increasing their birth rate, etc. Now, I'm mentioning all this that the new American administration is having to cope with, as we all are. And it is clear to us that the Middle East is going to suffer from instability for a long period of time, which I can't even estimate whether it's going to be years, dozens of years, a whole century. I mean, we have to prepare ourselves for everything. In that kind of situation, one of the things we chose to do, and that is my choice as a policy, is not to look for a clear solution, but rather to manage are contending and are grappling with all this based on certain vested interests while scrutinizing 
and ensuring our interest, ensuring that there won't be a clear-cut solution. Undoubtedly here, there is a need in a kind of world police force, a world policeman. So it's not totally clear to us what the American administration policy is. After all, President Trump has different policies than his predecessor. So we have seen here that in contrast to the previous administration um, and the use of nine Tomahawk missiles and chemical warfare, people can no longer sit in the sidelines, but yes, there are red lines that have been delineated very clearly now. And we have to think about what is going to be the future of Syria. We have, Syria, we have seen American assaults in south and eastern Syria against Syrian people. We're talking about the, the interception and toppling of a Syrian plane. We're talking about Shiite militias. How does one cut that entire kind of gamut of the Shiites that want to create a kind of ground corridor all the way through to Lebanon, through the other countries? So, of course, the Americans don't want to fight ISIS at the moment, so the, the Syrians are trying to take control of the border between Syria and Iraq in order to stabilize that kind of corridor. And the Americans are actually attacking them. It's a new phenomenon, which is a much more clear-cut policy and on other topics as well like in the Iranian topic we can see an, an Iranian uh, sort of regime that seems to be challenging the Americans led they're no longer trying to hit out at like in Bab el Mandeb with the Amer uh, when they tried to hit from Iran the US Mason and we can see a different kind of regime that is a little less challenging and intimidating, but they're also trying, they don't want to absorb more sanctions and all sorts of issues that beforehand. And I mean, there are changes, and Iran is sort of exploring the possible limits here, trying to challenge, how far can they challenge them? How far can they go? but they're really kind to stretch their limits and they can wait to see what will happen when the end of the GPCOA um, sort of period is no longer valid and it expires, so let's see what then happens. So here I would like to do a kind of short summary of our situation at the moment. Undoubtedly, these developments, I mean, I think it was the commander of the Air Force and the chief of general staff both spoke here, but I will say so perhaps from a political level now. There is no existential threat at the moment of, on the state of Israel. We're not talking about rockets and terror. Yes, there can be outbursts of that, but, and we're not talking about sort of an all-out war of other armies. But yes, we have seen the lone wolf. We've seen cast lead, protective edge. But even with that challenge of with the missiles, with the Hezbollah in the north and the Hamas in the south, but it's not an existential strand. IDF undoubtedly is the strongest army in the Middle East, and it is not lying back on its laurels, and it is deterring. We're enjoying effective ongoing deterrence, not by just sitting back and twiddling your thumbs, but much more, as was said by the Chief of General Staff and by the Commander of the Air Force, but we are talking about um, the, the actual campaign between the wars that we're now talking about. And if you look sort of in hindsight to the protective edge, three years since then, with all the criticizers, three years of a lull. And they have not shot the Hamas one missile since then. So believe me, it's three years, if anyone wants to say anything different, which is, a, which is unprecedented since 1967. So in other words, they've seen that. The Hamas have seen the heavy price they paid in protective edge. And that is sort of in the the background of all those unfounded and ungrounded kind of slogans that people were throwing up in the, in the air at the time. So we're talking about a cyber superpower when the whole world is grappling with that. We have become a cyber nation and with 
that is definitely safeguarding Israel and marching it forward in order to be able to face these challenges that other people, other countries are having difficulties with. We have actually withstood many a danger. If we're talking about Jordan and Egypt, and there were always things risking those pre peace accords, but we have shared interests and therefore it, they have remained stable. Yes, they've been coping with the extremist, fanatic uh, Islam, and yet here they have, it has prevailed, this peace. So now, when we say that there's no American sort of Africa, Arab coalition, I'd just like to explain something, that situations have changed, interests have changed. At the moment, the Sunni Arab camp, we have the same enemies, shared enemies. Iran is number one and not the Palestinians, and it, whether they interest them or not. And they have also got to grapple with the Muslim Brotherhood and have a look at how Egypt looks at the Hamastan, for example, in the Gaza. We're supplying electricity and humanitarian aid. They are not the Palestinians. So in other words, I mean, it was as if, you know, at time they were using proxies in Iraq and Syria, and they are now attacking them because it, ISIS, Al-Qaeda are now seen as a threat. We're talking about a widespread Sunni camp and at the helm is Saudi Arabia. And now during that period of the heir to the throne, so we're talking about a Sunni Arab co military coalition that is fighting actually in Yemen, not only paying proxies to do it for them, and we're in the same boat. So you can understand all sorts of things from that. Syria, of course, is dismantled. ISIS is in the Middle East, most especially with its ground stronghold, but it is being weakened, and they are trying to unify forces that are going to be fighting, again, fighting against them, and I believe they're going to be able to be defeated. We're going to, but they will continue trying and hitting with terror at different places, Europe and other places, but on the ground, I truly believe they can be defeated. They're being weakened. Other components, of course, are that we have a strong macroeconomic situation here in Israel, but unfortunately it doesn't permeate down. And so I will talk about the various internal challenges. Now the world of energy, we no longer dependent in the world on the Arab oil. We've also become quite independent because we found those gas deposits in the, in the Mediterranean, and that is a strategic and economic event. So what is left? Those various issues that challenge us, Hamis, Hamastan, world jihad, that so far, they are still fighting against us in Sinai, on, in the Golan Heights, and first and foremost, Iran. To my chagrin, we have not found any common denominator with the world about against Iran. Um, perhaps Trump will understand that. I think they are the most significant actual um, variable in the instabilization destabilization of the Middle East over the last years. So they're not, I mean, we're talking about grappling with us through proxies, but the aim is to eradicate and wipe us off the maps and it's still on their agenda. Although, yes, there were very, we don't have a border conflict and though we have no occupation, as they call it, of, of, of their borders or land, and because they, but this is a sacred, holy sort of Muslim land, and that is their claim, and therefore they are still striving to achieve nuclear weaponry and hit at us through proxies, the Palestinian jihadists and the Hezbollah and others, and they're still being trained and armed by the Iranians. Now, if I need to propose to the Americans something, I would say you have no alternative but you have got to be a world policeman because without that, your interest in the region will be st won't be stabilized. We see that American pro-activist is the one clear thing that could say, would help everyone. But I, I know that uh, not in Riyadh and, and Cairo and uh, Manama and other places, this is the... This is another, perhaps not there, but the Israeli-Palestinian issue is definitely of paramount importance. 
here today, we need to convince our friends in the United States, number one, that there's no chance of a permanent agreement, not even of an interim agreement. We do not have a partner. But on the other hand, we need to decide for ourselves that we do not want a binational state. So when I hear people talking about a, a possibility with a new American administration, let's start annexing the sea territories and start building everything. Is that our interest? And I'm very worried about that. And I've seen sort of men, all sorts of signs of pressure in the coalition, dragging them in directions that we had no intention to go in. Since the whole ideas about settlements and the agreements between Bush and Sharon in 2004, and uh, since uh, Bibi took office in 2009, we haven't actually created new settlements only just now. Does this serve our interest? We need to aspire ultimately to a partition. The political partition separation already exists. We have to preserve that territorial separation as well, and we have to prevent any decisions of that kind. And that's just for ourselves I'm talking about at the moment. I'm really frightened about that kind of trend. I think it is very unhealthy. And we, if we don't want the Palestinians either to be a minority of sort of or to get a right to, to vote in the Knesset, then we ought to lead to that kind of di di in that direction. And I think w those uh, various trips that are taking place will, even now, I think that this will lead the Americans to understand that actually in short term, we can't see a permanent agreement actually being agreed to. But there's so many um, the factors that we are trying to sort of strengthen, but they're going to still be dependent on us on security, infrastructure, and other things in the next few years, the Palestinians. But another issue is that the issue of education and the fact that they are um, paying for salaries for the actual um, convict, those who are actually imprisoned, and that's something I brought up during the peace accords. And uh, we have to decide on some kind of strategic warning because I cannot see, at the time I said that Arafat is not planning for peace, but rather for a jihad. So in that reality that does exist with that kind of reasonable security situation that ought to be safeguarded and maintained, and in that same sort of campaign between wars, I think we have to really work on our internal resilience. And that is not only in external security, that has internal components that are of paramount importance. And I said a year ago, and since then, I have not seen a change for the good. Just yesterday, an additional investigation started that there's a connection between that and uh, go the government, the, the regime. I don't know all the details, nor the nitty gritty of all the other affairs that are being investigated, like 3,000 and the others, but I can just see a kind of manipulation, but this one is always very concerning. So if the priorities are not in the favor or for the benefit of the sake of Israel and the benefit would only be greediness, then I'm sorry that that is not for the benefit of the state of Israel. So we have to think about a transaction that I curbed in 2016 that actually dealt with submarines. Now, what can one do with that kind, those kind of sums? And, and uh, that's another thing that has to be thought about. Here we have a third prime minister that is now being investigated. That really is very concerning if we're talking about the confidence and the trust of the public in the actual in its leadership. And we're also, if we're talking about that, the, the not only that, the Supreme Court of Justice, the public who ought to have their voice heard, they don't need to be yes man. These are all kind of phenomena that is really worrying me. And of course, national resilience and bridging economic and social, social gaps. Despite in the macroeconomic issues, we find ourselves in a top, very good place. Unfortunately, hasn't permeated and unfortunately, the poverty is rising and the middle class is actually being corroded. So we must, although we are democracy, and we have to be very careful not to gnaw at the actual pillars of democracy, so we have to be very careful that there shouldn't be any kind of alienation of any parts of our society. We cannot allow ourselves a culture of sort of incitement against anyone in our culture, either against the, the Haredis, the leftists, the 
the Arabs, anyone else. And that here I see a lack of leadership, but rather some kind of survivability instinct that is, and they do use that incitement against other sectors just in order to remain in office. So therefore I chose the my path because of all that and I sincerely hope that I will be able and I'm experienced enough and I'll be have the chance to bring us back to the track that I would like us all to be on.